Hi, I am Dr. Kim Sage. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. Welcome to my YouTube channel and to this video series, diving even further into how certain events in childhood can set us up to often receive certain types of diagnostic labels, disorders, to have experiences that regardless of where, where we find these labels, like in the DSM-5, which is not a perfect manual for many, for many of us, for many different reasons, both culturally and individually and experientially, it's complicated. But at the, at the present, this is what we have. And so I'm gonna be going into some disorders that are found often related to traumatic experiences in childhood and how those can play out in our adult lives. So we're gonna go through the section in the, in the manual today called the trauma and stressor related disorders. I'm gonna to try to focus on those this week, talking about PTSD, acute stress disorder, and many other disorders. And so I hope you'll stick around for that. I'm gonna try not to go too into the main little individual criteria and to give you an overarching, just a feeling of what these disorders are about. And then you can go do, if you want to, as always, more research to help understand sort of what might be appropriate uh, for you to, to learn more about and to seek treatment or support for, for you or even a child or someone you know. So the first one we're gonna talk about is reactive attachment disorder. Now this disorder has some controversy as do many, as I said, issues in the DSM-5. And what I really wanna just get to outside of this, this label of this disorder, which can be a label and for many parents, be you know, a roadblock in terms of support and treatment. There's a lot of reasons why there's, this might be an issue, but what I wanna just at the heart explain is that while we're still lacking a lot of research in many areas, especially around RAD and other ones, as, ch as children kind of grow, how there is an impact profoundly upon, for many of us, that does support that what happens to us in childhood can have truly impactful um, consequences not just on us, let's say as adults, but when kids are still in childhood. And I think we really don't talk enough about that because it's also really difficult to research, right? How do you put kids through that kind of rigorous research while also not compromising and being appropriate with ethics and safety and things like that. But the heart of this disorder used to be kind of in two, in, in one disorder in the DSM-5, and now it's been split apart. And tomorrow we'll talk about its counterpart. But today we're gonna to talk about what it means. So the idea is that reactive attachment disorder is a disorder that we see when kids are still in childhood, often very young. And that, I, that the, the main thread here is that there's a kind of social neglect or wounding that occurs in, in severe ways that impacts the child's attachment seeking and engaging behaviors. And with RAD, basically what we're seeing is that these are kids who, when they're distressed, they're not reaching out for caregivers like we would expect them to. And so they're really not showing any consistency around obtaining comfort or support or nurturance or protection. And if you think about the heart of attachment, a lot of it is how do we respond to those needs, right? So there are varying degrees within anxious or avoidant, but basically what's happening here is the belief is that there were for some for some reason and i'll go into that limited opportunities for the child to develop these attachment patterns and so what they played out in is that they're not really engaging in expressions of positive emotions and engagement with caregivers and in addition to that their emotional regulation abilities are compromised and so they can display episodes of negative emotions fear sadness or irritability anger and they may not always be readily explained by you know their behavior why they're acting that way now it usually starts in infancy and remember that in infancy we are still impacted trauma is still living in our bodies it's just that we don't have the language yet and or the capacity in our cognitive development to say you know yes this happened to me and this is how i'm responding but all that is living in the child's body and so what we can see are symptoms around unexplained withdrawal, as I said, fear, irritability, sadness, not seeking or showing comforting behaviors, uh, even responding to comfort, failure to even smile, right, to have social engagement, watching others closely but then not engaging in social interaction, 
not really reaching out in return when they're picked up and attempted to be soothed and cuddled, behavior problems, developmental differences in terms of how they engage in interactive games like peekaboo, um, and really just failing to seek support and assistance. Now, part of the controversy also surrounds how really at the core, this is a developmental trauma and that it might be better to sort of put these in that comprehensive category of developmental trauma, meaning that some things have happened along the way that, that have blocked or inhibited or prohibited natural developmental behaviors that we would expect for most kids to go through. Now, in terms of the diagnostic criteria, we, we must see that this is occurring before the age of five and that the child has a developmental age of at least nine months. Now there must be no criteria met for autism spectrum disorders and if it continues for longer than 12, 12 months it can be specified as a persistent rat type situation. Now alongside this disorder we do see other types of comorbidities and those can include things like uh, cognitive delays, language delays, Often we can see medical symptoms like severe malnutrition, certainly depressive symptoms can occur. And along those lines, what are the differential diagnoses? Meaning if it's not this, what else might it be? What are the other closely related or similarly presenting disorders? So certainly autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disabilities, and so we're not talking about an intellectual disability if we're seeing these behaviors. And certain depressive disorders can have certain types of presentations with kids that can, you know, look like disengagement and all of those types of things. So it's really important if you suspect this one to have a very trained and licensed person, clinician who understands these disorders and understands how to do assessments of these types of disorders. So what kinds of situations might cause this? And the idea is that we often can see it in kids who have lived in institutions or children's homes, who have been bounced around to different caregivers or foster care dynamics, who may have parents with severe mental health issues or criminal behaviors or substance abuse issues. We can see it in kids who have had prolonged separations from caregivers due to out-of-home placements hospitalizations, or even death of a primary caregiver. And as I said though, even if you've had all of those things, it doesn't mean you will have this response. But the idea is that I want you to understand how profound on, in the extreme, these types of wounds and, and traumas can affect our lives. And so we know that without treatment, there's a very good chance these, can, you know, these behaviors can continue for a lifetime. What we don't have is a lot of great research although there has been more in the last few years, around reactive attachment disorder. But it's certainly affecting things like your mental and physical health, your intellectual development, how you might use substances, things of that nature. Now, how do we prevent something like this? The idea is that we would learn to be, in terms of treatments, I'll come to that in a second, but be actively engaged with our babies, eye to eye, face to face, talking, smiling, engaging, attuning, really learning to interpret their different cues, right? So what is a hungry cry? What is a diaper cry? You know, when we're attuned parents, we kind of start to, we start to figure those things out. And that also affects kind of how we respond might play into our attachment patterns, right? So if I don't like a lot of crying and negativity and I have a more avoidant style, I might not respond as much. I might have a baby cried out longer in the crib, whereas a more anxious parent might have a hard time separating at all, right? It just depends. Not that all anxious caregivers can't separate, but the, you know what I'm saying. The bottom line is that our issues are going to affect at the core, and this really is our issue. That's the goal of this whole understanding of this, is this is about what adults do. These aren't about kids who came out of the womb this way. The idea is that there's a, a severe social dynamic that impacted them, and so they're just responding in the best way they know how. So providing warm and nurturing interactions, responding both verbally and non-verbally to your baby or children, maybe understanding how, learning how kids work, right? Many of us are taught what to expect and what's appropriate developmentally and what's not. And to, to remember that it's our job to teach kids how to deal with life in the world. They don't come out of the womb knowing how to do that. And so 
as I said, I really wanted to share this one not only to understand that there are actual diagnoses around how, how these types of childhoods affect children and adults, but also to just expose you to some of the language in the clinical world. Now, what kinds of, of therapies can help? Certainly psychosocial supports, looking at all the different factors that affect a family and providing support. Um, psychoeducation, you know, teaching families about these things, parenting skills and classes, certainly family therapy and also individual therapy. Um, what we don't want to use and has been very much uh, made to be very clear that it's abusive and not effective are using these types of historical attachment therapy treatments that were forcing kids to engage in attachment behaviors through physical restraint other types of in, in invasive types of therapy. And so you can research more on that. But I think the goal is understanding, like I said, that these things have an impact. I think it's hard if, you're, if you have a child who gets this diagnosis because you're talking about, well, this only comes from severe wounding and whether or not that's the case and how that, all that plays out, I can see how that has different impacts for families. And so I do think that arguing, I believe as Bessel van der Kolk has argued that really this should be developmental trauma. And I think that's where we're all moving towards. So anyway, that is reactive attachment disorder. I'm curious what you think about this and what your experiences have been. Maybe you don't fit that criteria, but you understand how your own emotional neglect in childhood or experiences have impacted your comfort seeking behaviors. I mean, I think at the bare minimum, outside of intense emotional abuse and not, not in terms of this disorder, but understanding that how a parent responds to us over time and patterns is going to really impact, as I really believe, the map of the attachment world. And while attachment theory is not perfect and has its issues, I think it's most helpful to understand it from the bottom line of that what happens to us in childhood very often, along with our genetics, really sets the stage for what we go into the world believing as adults. And then, of course, we have lots of other attachment type experiences that shape it. But at the core, these very earliest years of the adult's nervous system and their attachment pattern meets your attachment system and pattern and actually meets your nervous system and then together creates an attachment pattern as separate from, like I said, genetics and biology and things of that nature. So anyway, I will see you tomorrow. We'll discuss more about these disorders and how our childhoods can affect how we um, deal with life. So don't forget to subscribe and click the bell if you're new here. And if you want to learn more about courses I offer and other resources I have, please check out the links down below. And my website also has links on books and things like that. So please stay safe and well, and I will see you tomorrow. Take care. Bye, guys.